Yeah, the little ones, um, the owlets are so cute. We've never seen so clo up close. We're hoping they're gonna come up and they're gonna see this and they're gonna say, holy cow, you know, and they get the kids kind of thing. Today on This American Land, researchers are enticing beavers into doing some free labor with a great payoff for fish, birds, and humans. There's little voltage sensors all over the surface of the skin, and as an object come, comes by, the voltage changes, and it, and it says, aha, lunch. Or it says, I'm gonna be lunch, and it runs away. You'll get a charge out of this story. We'll show you how knife fish use electrical signals to see in the dark. We named him Boots. It was a little springtail that looked like he was wearing white boots and had a gray fuzzy coat on. Birds, mammals, and the tiniest of plants and animals. Citizen scientists document them all in the Smoky Mountains. Those stories and more now on This American Land. Funding for This American Land provided by the Weiss Foundation and the Turner Foundation. Hello and welcome to This American Land. I'm Caroline Ravel. And I'm Bruce Burkhart. On this and every show, we'll take you to some of the nitty gritty field work that's needed to protect our natural resources. And here's a good example. Some engineering projects require the help of a supercomputer or an expert at an elite university. But every once in a while, Mother Nature trains the most talented builders. Details now about a beaver restoration project in a story produced by Ed Yon for Oregon Field Guide. It's 20 degrees out, and on the face of it, what Ian Tatum is about to do is crazy. This is just another day at the office. It's Ian's job to snorkel in the middle of the night, in the middle of winter, in the middle of the Oregon desert to search for salmon and steelhead. Actually, the first winter I did this, it stayed pretty warm and never really got below freezing. It was kind of a mild winter. That's where I kind of got the idea that, hey, this is not bad. It's pretty cool. The next winter, it got down to about zero for a bunch of nights. And like, this is not cool. Ian is working with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. It might seem strange that an agency with ocean in its name is doing research in the desert, but salmon and steelhead live here too, and NOAA has a mission to protect them. So Ian spends about 30 nights a year, face down in the water, counting fish. In the wintertime, when the waters blow about 46 Fahrenheit, these fish are nocturnal, so they'll burrow down into the gravel or move out and hide in the edges and under undercut banks and stuff during the daytime. They only come out at night, so we have to come out when it's full dark and get in the water at night to catch them. Doing fish checkups is one way that NOAA gauges the health of Bridge Creek near John Day. In this section, at least, the fish seem to be doing okay. This is a real typical size for a fish to smolt or go to the ocean, so in another month or so, it'll get, start getting a lot more silvery and, and head downstream. But here's the problem as Noah sees it. Salmon and steelhead are tough enough to survive an ocean full of predators and even a Columbia River full of dams. But once they migrate back upstream, many of the creeks they return to along the John Day River are eroded and in terrible shape. This is channel incision on steroids. So this is a pretty extreme example. Chris Jordan works for Noah too. It's only recently that NOAA even looked at how places like this affect salmon and steelhead recovery. 100, 150 years ago, Myers Creek ran on the top. All of the flat benches was the old floodplain, and because it is this really erodible landscape, the stream cut down. So here, right on the edge of this incised channel, you've got bare soil. You've got this cut edge, and you've got erosion, and you have the problem in salmon habitat when you're getting too much sediment in. Grazing has taken a big toll on creeks in central Oregon. So is road building and the once common practice of straightening creeks out or diverting them into ditches. Now there are ways to fix this, but they involve a lot of heavy equipment, a lot of engineers, and a lot of money. Chris didn't have any of that, but he saw something that caught his attention. Where Beaverhead returned, streams seemed to do better. 
This is beaver country. The populations are coming back. There's a beaver dam right over here. 2005, there were 300 juvenile steelhead rearing in there in the summer. It's beaver and the way their dams push water around that give healthy streams their curves and their pools. The salmon have no problem getting around these dams, while the beaver ponds themselves seem to be an important part of salmon and steelhead habitat, according to Michael Pollack. When we started looking at whether there might be fish use in these ponds, we took an electroshocker, low setting, and just put it into a, a small pond, and we just watched as all of these juvenile steelhead just boiled to the top, and, and, and literally the thing was just, uh, just alive with fish, and we realized, yeah, we're onto something here. So the NOAA team came up with a novel idea. Entice beaver into places that need restoration, and then let the beaver do the work. I mean, if you could make all of Bridge Creek look like this, I think you'd have a much more robust trout population, you'd have more songbirds. Yeah, that would be great. How do you attract beaver? Well, the NOAA team started by pounding posts into the creek to give beaver an enticing foundation for new dams. In other places, they reinforced existing dams so that the dams might last longer. This is a beaver dam that we assisted. We helped reinforce it with these posts that you see. We know this was built last year, and beaver came in. We don't know where they came from. To make things even more irresistible, Michael puts out a buffet of wood cuttings to encourage the beaver to stick around. Tonight, we're hoping they're gonna come up and they're going to see this, and they're going to say, holy cow, you know, and they get the kids kind of thing. And, and they come here, and they just have a party. Now, it might seem odd that for a story where beavers are the main character, we're not seeing many. Well, in all our years producing for Oregon Field Guide, we've actually only seen them a few times, including once when they were released into a stream by biologists. Michael studies beaver for a living, but... Even he says he rarely sees them at work because they are extremely wary, especially in the desert where they don't have much cover. When do they come out? What are their patterns of behavior? How is it altered by predation? We don't know that. You know, you think about it, it's hard to really know what these guys are doing. They work at night, they're underwater, they don't want to be seen. They've got predators around here that they're trying to avoid. Which is the funny thing about this project. The entire thing is built on the labor of a creature hardly anyone ever sees. And yet this ghost helper is ultimately responsible for whether the project is a success. These are some nice fresh beaver tracks here. It's neat to see because we just put in a structure uh, last week. It's fresh and it's clear evidence. This is backing up so we know that there's been some work to raise the water table a little. So it's just everything. It's everything but seeing a beaver. What they do see are salmon and steelhead. These steelhead have evolved in the presence of beavers in these creeks. There's some fish in pools like this, but they really like to congregate in big, deep beaver ponds. Bringing back beaver does mean embracing new ponds and occasional floods, which is, of course, one reason why Oregon's state animal isn't real popular with some ranchers and farmers. I mean, beavers don't have a good reputation in the state, right? I mean, beavers are a nuisance animal, and so what we're doing is encouraging them, and that sort of runs contrary to how normally that animal is managed or how people interact with that animal. I think we're just sort of trying to go back and say, what if there were more beaver? What if they had more stable populations? What if they had more stable structures? Would that affect what the stream looks like? And so those are ideas, are, they're, they're new. Chris is conducting this experiment on government land, where beaver ponds and flooding aren't as much a concern. He hopes places like this will get people to rethink the role of beavers by showing how dams raise the water table and reduce erosion, all the while helping fish. At the very least, it's hard to argue with the cost of the free, if somewhat elusive, labor. No one has done this, so yeah, that's what's very neat. Uh, we're learning how to work with beaver, and, and uh, so it's nice to get a validation. We think we know what they want, and here they are. Um, so very exciting. Beavers may be pretty good construction workers, but some other animals know a thing or two about electricity. As Miles O'Brien explains in our Science Nation report, the electric knife fish may also inspire the design of some new underwater robots. 
Like a taser, an electric eel can generate enough current to stun its prey. These so-called weakly electric fish generate electricity too, but not enough to do any harm. With the proper equipment, you can even hear an electric hum. These fish are unique in that they produce and detect electric fields, and they use these electric fields in social communication and to detect objects. With support from the National Science Foundation, neuroethologist Eric Fortune traveled to Ecuador to study the weekly electric knife fish in its native habitat. Back at Johns Hopkins University, his research partner, mechanical engineer Noah Cowan, and others are studying the knife fish in the lab. He says it uses its electric field as a sixth sense, not only to communicate, but to navigate its surroundings and to find its next meal. There's a small organ in the tail of the weekly electric fish that generates an electric field, and then that electric field envelops the entire animal. When an object passes through the field, the fish has receptors on its skin to detect it. There's little voltage sensors all over the surface of the skin, and as an object com comes by, the voltage changes and it, and it says, aha, lunch. Or it says, I'm gonna be lunch, and it runs away. Each fish generates its own unique frequency, which can change when other knife fish are near. When the two fish come by, their two pitches begin to interact much like two singer's pitches would interact. And what we've done is really began to explore how multiple fish, more than two, interact. The fish will swim both forwards and backwards using his ribbon fin. And when the lights go out and it's hard for the fish to see, they seem to lean even more on their electro sense to navigate. When the lights are on, they, you move the tube and they're just tracking along like this. When you turn off the lights, they start sort of almost like they're feeling around with their electrosense. They start moving around back and forth. The goal is to understand how the brain of this unique animal controls its behavior. And engineers at Northwestern University are developing a highly agile robot that may one day use a similar sixth sense to monitor the health of coral reefs or navigate the dark, murky waters of an oil spill. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien. Quick, think of some of your favorite outdoor activities and sports. Got them? Well, if you're like 50 million other Americans, you may not have thought of hiking or fishing, but birding. And some of these lucky enthusiasts are getting to check out young raptors in Boise, Idaho. Architect Steve Pavlik is getting a peek at how some of his wild neighbors live. Four in here. Volunteers help maintain these nest boxes tucked in trees along wet riparian areas around the Morley Nelson Snake River Birds of Prey area. Just a short drive from Pavlik's home in Boise, Idaho, this area harbors the greatest concentration of nesting birds of prey in North America. Yeah, there were three young and two eggs when I checked this. I don't know if they're just doing here. My name is Sozila Nagis Warren. This couple drove more than nine hours for this opportunity to see these western screech owls and their roughly two-week-old young. No, I've never handled a, <laughs> an owlet before, or for that matter, any little baby bird. <laughs> Yeah, the little ones, um, the owlets are so cute. And the big ones also, we have never seen so clo up close. This adult keeps a close watch as volunteers approach its nest box. Its bark colored plumage blends so well, it's almost invisible from a distance. Once out of the box, these nestlings get identification bands. But securing the metal band around such a tiny leg is enough to make the first timer's hands shake. I'm quite nervous about this. Here, okay, now, now that you've got it started, you want to come in from the top like this, oh, yeah. grab it, and then squeeze and roll. Oh. But John Doremus is a steady guide after working as a biologist for the Bureau of Land Management for 30 years. Now retired, he's president of the Snake River Raptor Volunteers, a group working to improve habitat and nesting for raptors in this BLM National Conservation Area. We're just going down to this little tree line right here. I have a box in there. <laughs> These small owls range in weight from four ounces, about the heft of an iPhone, up to 11 ounces. 
They seek out cavities for their nests, but in this open desert country, such natural cavities are scarce. So Doremus took matters into his own hands. A friend of mine and I put up our first owl boxes in 82, we actually started monitoring them and we've been doing that ever since. Now, you did the work so you get the pleasure of looking first. Now Doremus has nearly 30 years of data on this population, documenting behavior like how faithful individuals are to their mates and to nest sites. These adults often return to the same nest year after year, and screech owls are thought to keep the same mate. After the young fledge, Dorema sifts through their nesting materials to see what they've been eating. Mainly they are small rodent feeders. In the wintertime, they feed on birds. Now, with decades of data, Dorema says he can investigate long-term questions like whether climate change is altering their diet. But beyond the science, he likes to introduce citizens to wild roadside attractions they might not find on their own, like this family of great horned owls. These fledglings look big enough to be adults, but their fuzzy down gives away their young age. The great horned owl fledglings were really cool. Um, a lot bigger than the screech owls. A teacher from Nampa, Idaho, Corey Fromm, learned about this birding opportunity when a BLM education specialist brought raptors to her classroom. It's amazing to see how many different birds there are. Every time we stop, it's more than just the owls um, that we've seen. We see all the different raptors and stuff, and to realize how close they are all in proximity to you know, where we live, and you don't have to go that far to see them. It's really fun. Western screech owls are widespread, they can be found across low elevation woodlands throughout much of Western North America. Great horned owls have an even greater range. And without a trained eye, these well camouflaged neighbors can be easily overlooked. So watch closely. Who would want to miss these majestic birds of prey? A fish that once thrived in the southwest is facing severe threats from habitat loss and other human activity. Biologists are using every tool they can to restore healthy populations of the razorback sucker. On the border between Arizona and Nevada, scientists navigate Lake Mojave and the Colorado River looking for endangered native fish. For the past 20 years, state and federal agencies in the Native Fish Work Group have helped prevent these rare desert fish from vanishing forever. These are critically endangered species. They certainly, without human intervention right now, this species would probably be on the brink of extinction. During the annual Razorback Roundup, aquatic ecologist Paul Marsh and his team concentrate on recovery of the razorback sucker. I feel good. Yeah. A wound on the left lateral surface, and he's got scars too, yeah. Oh, yeah. Found nowhere else on Earth, this species was once so abundant that Native Americans used it as fertilizer and livestock feed. But since 1991, it's been on the endangered species list. As a result of primarily human modifications of the system, including the construction of the high dams, and the introduction of non-native fishes, mostly for recreational resources, the razorback sucker and a number of other species in the system began to disappear. Once thought to be one of the most numerous species in the entire Colorado River Basin, today, wild razorbacks are believed to have vanished. The program as we know it today was designed to take the young from the few adults that remain and raise them up in protective custody and then repatriate them to the lake. In spite of these efforts, most razorbacks born in the wild still do not make it to adulthood and populations are not growing. But researchers still remain optimistic about the resilient razorback. We keep learning new things. This is a process of discovery, and I think a lot of us would like to hope that the magic bullet is still out there. We just haven't found it yet. Sophisticated fish tracking equipment developed by Marsh and his team are helping advance razorback research. Many of us like to hope that backwater habitat is being the salvation for this species. The conservation strategy involves using these kinds of places that are free of non-native predators where the razorback and the bony tail can both reproduce larvae that survive, and we can use those to repopulate other areas. 
Careful genetic screening during this process is critical for survival of future wild populations. Despite the conversion from the wild fish to the repatriates, we're still actually maintaining genetic diversity. To date, over $100 million has been spent in razorback sucker recovery, with far more pledged for the conservation of dozens of other native fish species here. Although some believe that recovery of the razorback sucker isn't feasible, Marsh believes otherwise. It does cost money and take time to conserve nature, but um, to my knowledge, that has not been a detriment to the development of our economy, to our to our job market, etc. And um, I think we're all better off if we have these critters around than if, than if we don't. A census can give us a good idea of who's living in the neighborhood and how a community can best plan for the future. It's tough enough when you're counting people, but even more challenging when you're trying to get a handle on plants and animals. To do that in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, researchers are getting some help from volunteers of all ages. Hi, Mary. How you doing? Good. The Great Smoky Mountains National Park is renowned for its biodiversity. Just give it a whack. When we heard that there were a group of biologists down here identifying things in the park, we wanted to participate in that so we ourselves could learn. The more we look, the more eyes there are out there. The more dirt we're turning over, the more things we find. And the more scientists we can get involved in it so they tell us what we found, then that's great. I discovered life in America. <laughs> My name is Adrian Mayer, and I'm the uh, museum curator for the Natural History Collection here at Great Smoky Mountains National Park. The collection consists of about 200,000 specimens. It includes everything from insects to bears, uh, salamanders. There are three animals in this jar. The largest one is almost two and a half feet long including the largest salamander ever collected in North America. About 10 years ago, people were saying, well, what do we really have in the park? And they didn't really know. Nobody had, had done any sort of comprehensive surveying. And, and so they thought, if they're going to build a road or if they're going to build a campground, they're going to want to know what's in that area before they do anything in case there's something incredibly rare there. You know, we have a lot of people that come to the park or wanting to see the elk or wanting to see the black bear. I'm Todd Witcher, executive director of Discover Life in America. Okay. Oh, that's there, one right that's there. That's one right there. Yeah. But getting people to look at smaller things that we walk by every day and don't put any value with, that's one of the goals of what we do. It's about ready to get it to <laughs> And so our mission is basically to document everything that lives here in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. This is a little Botrychium virginianum. And um, we've been doing this for about 12 years, uh, and we've uh, found ni over 900 new species. 35, 6. One of the real keys to what we do is getting citizens involved in our work. Thank you. We call them citizen scientists. I'm Marilyn Nealans. I grew up in the mountains. I've been coming to volunteer every time I get a chance, whenever they're on this side of the mountains. And we've sorted insects and we've charted ferns. Oh, 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 oh. But to be with the scientists and just watch the focus when they say, oh, look what that is. It just, it's great. I think you got them. I'm so lucky that I have a granddaughter who shares my interests because they don't all automatically do that. Yeah, you got something there. I enjoy the most of going out and doing things instead of staying inside. I'm Sheila, and I'm 13. It has these rings of silvery scales. We learned what springtails looked like, and that they're more common than you'd think. That's like the eighth specimen known to science. And we found one that he was very excited to find. We named him Boots. It was a little springtail that looked like he was wearing white boots and had a gray fuzzy coat on. I think every child that comes into the mountains and touches something like this and has a grown-up say, this is whatever it is, I don't think that kid is going to grow up to do anything bad to do anything that's in the Smokies. I like to learn how, what the plants are. New York fern, Christmas fern. I like to walk 
on the trail. What do you have? Ladybug. Yep. Oh. We're trying to stimulate the next generation to be interested in science. About 60% of the world's biodiversity will disappear before we even know about it. We get asked a lot, why are you doing this? Are you counting bugs? Is this, what is the value in this? And I think certainly knowing what exists in a place is the, would be the first step in helping protect it. I've got to tell you about this amazing story that we're working on for a future show. Do it. Okay. 75 million year old dinosaur bones. Elephant this is just so cool. Dinosaur. Flying through the air on a helicopter. <laughs> landing. And then I get to play paleontologist for the day. I don't want to hear about it. I was so jealous when I heard you were going to do that. You should be jealous because it was amazing. What a blast. Well, thanks for watching. Every week we'll bring you more stories about protecting our landscapes, waters, and wildlife. And you can always check us out anytime at thisamericanland.org. We'll see you next time. For more information about this program, visit thisamericanland.org. Funding for This American Land provided by the Weiss Foundation and the Turner Foundation.